Today we're going to talk about how to build a virus. And just like we did when we talked about genomes, we're going to try and simplify it. So you remember we could simplify all the virus genomes to seven different types. So today we're going to simplify all the different kinds of viruses to two, maybe three types. Before we start, <clears throat> some definitions, because I'll use all these terms a lot, and I want you to know what, <clears throat> what it means. A subunit, you know, when we talk about building a particle or a virus particle or a virion, we're going to talk about subunits. These are single polypeptides. And here, for example, are a couple of single polypeptides, VP1, VP2, VP3. VP is often used to describe these. They're virion proteins. And these are subunits because they fold up to make a structural unit. So a structural unit is the unit from which capsids or nucleocapsids are built. And we'll talk about a capsid and a nucleocapsid in a minute. But for example, when these three subunits come together, the blue, the yellow, and the red, uh, they form a structural unit, which uh, you can see is here is made up of one of each. Now, capsid is what we call this. This is the virus particle. That's poliovirus here, and that would be this. So this would be the polio capsid, the gray guy right here. And that's actually from the Latin for box. That's the protein shell surrounding the genome. So you can see inside of that would be the genome. The nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly within the virion. So there are specific cases where we talk about nucleocapsids. So here, this rabies virus, uh, this curly green uh, molecule, that's a nucleocapsid. It's, it's RNA bound to protein, all right? So it's always an RNA protein or a nucleic acid protein complex. In this retrovirus, the same thing, this green molecule is the nucleocapsid. Now poliovirus, just has naked RNA inside of it, all right, in the upper right. That RNA is not a nucleocapsid because it doesn't have any protein associated with it. Uh, the envelope is what we call the membrane around uh, the particle. Here in this retrovirus, that's the envelope. Uh, here in rabies, that's the envelope right there. And these are, these are lipid membranes derived from the host cell. So we call them envelopes. And finally, the virion is the infectious virus particle. So whenever I say virion, I mean the infectious particle. Um, that's assumed that it's infectious. If you say virus particle, you're not, there's no assumption about infectivity. So this is a virion, a retrovirus virion in the lower right. This is a rabies virion. This is a polio virion. So that's, that's what we mean by these terminologies. <clears throat> Now, virion proteins, that is the proteins that make up the virion, the capsid that are embedded in the envelope, they have very specific functions. They're there to protect the genome. Each of these virus particles has a nucleic acid genome within it. So it, one function is to be a stable shell that protects it because viruses spend a lot of their time traveling between hosts or between cells, and the, the virion proteins protect it. As you'll see later, during assembly of new virus particles, the virion proteins have to recognize the nucleic acid and package it. Uh, and then for those viruses that have to form an envelope or that acquire an envelope during maturation, uh, the viral proteins, the structural proteins, have to be able to participate in that process. Uh, on the other side of things, these virion proteins they do have to protect the genome, but they have to deliver it to the cell. In most cases, the genome either gets out of the particle or is, or is released in some way, and the virion proteins have to know how to do that. They have to bind cell receptors, which we'll talk about next time. They have to participate in uncoding, which is release of the genome into the cell. For some viruses that have membranes, these shown here, the membranes have to fuse with a cellular membrane. So in order for the genome to get from inside the particle to inside the cell, a fusion, a fusion event has to occur. That'll be the topic of, of the next lecture on Wednesday. And finally, um, the genome has to be brought to the right place in the cell. So it's not always deposited just underneath the plasma membrane. Sometimes it has to get deeper into the cytoplasm. Sometimes it has to go into the nucleus. 
and that depends, of course, on the nucleic acid, which is something you should be able to predict from the Baltimore scheme. Okay, so those are some of the functions of these viral proteins. Virions are metastable. I want you not to think of them as a passive particle that's simply taken up into the cell and opens up. I want you to think of them as a machine because they are machines, as you will see, they have moving parts and they do work, they expend energy. And this vir we, we say that virions are metastable because they have to be both stable and unstable. They have to be stable to protect the genome as it goes from cell to cell, but they also have to come apart quickly during infection to release the genome at the right trigger. So they're both stable and unstable. So here, for example, is a stable virion on the lower left. It's very good at protecting the genome. If this were polio, it would be good at protecting against low pH of the intestinal tract, all the proteases and bile acids that are present. Incredibly stable structure. But when it gets into the right cell, which is shown on the right, and upon the right triggers from that cell, which we will also talk about later, the virion has to become unstable and let the genome out. So that's why we call them uh, metastable. Now, in, in other terms, in, in energetic terms, um, they're metastable because they're not at their minimum free energy conformation. So on this graph, this is a graph of, of energy uh, versus time. And virions exist in the, in the first place here at an intermediate energy level. They would really like to get down to their minimum energy level three here, but there is usually a barrier to achieving that. So this is the virion. Number one is the virion as it passes from cell to cell and is stable and protects the, the genome. To get to three, it must get to three to release its nucleic acid. And to do that, it has to surmount this unfavorable uh, energy barrier. And that happens during entry, and the triggers are provided typically by the host cell. Right, so you can see a, a virion is not a passive uh, particle that is simply brought into the cell and releases its genome. So this energy barrier that the particle has to overcome to get to the minimum free energy, uh, as I said, is it is supplied by signals from the cell, the right receptor, the right intracellular environment. It could be low pH. It could be a protease that changes the particle in some way, but that's the right place for this to happen. The, the virus particle doesn't want to give up its genome in the wrong cell, so it depends on very specific cues. All right, so we say that virions are spring-loaded. This happens during assembly. We put energy into the structure, and then on the right signal, the virion pops open and gives up um, its genome. So the energy stored during assembly is, is expended during disassembly. And a, a good example or analogy for this are these uh, Japanese toys, Bakugan. Um, these are, my, my kids have these. These are, inside of each of these is a character. And when these balls roll over a piece of metal, they spring open. And the, you can see the character and it's part of a game, I think. But it's, just, it's the same analogy with a virus particle. The virus hits the right cell, it will spring open and release the genome. And you need energy to do that. And the energy was put into the particle during assembly and stored there. And then only when the virion hits the right cell, the right receptor, the right intracellular environments, will it pop open and release the genome. OK, so these are wonderful uh, little machines that, that uh, play an active process or an active role in disassembly. So when we talk about virions, there are two two things we have to consider, both the structure and the function. Because these are, these are wonderful designs. Uh, you know, if there were an architect designing these, it would be a perfect structure-function uh, relationship. So the virion has a structure that has evolved to play its role in all the things that we've said, protection, uncoding, and so forth. And the structure is created by taking many identical proteins and repeating them many times to give you maximum contact and non-covalent bonding. So here is, on the upper right is a typical virion. We're, this one's made up of three different proteins repeated over and over. And these proteins have symmetrical interactions among themselves. That's how they can fit together into this nice shape. But they're not covalently bound because if you covalently linked all these proteins, they wouldn't be able to come apart. Well, maybe they could, but you'd have to put an awful lot of energy into them. So you want non-covalent bonding. So again, 
many identical proteins, repeated maximal contact non-covalent bonding. And of course, the function of the virion, uh, a big one, is genome delivery. And that can happen because the structure is not bonded together. So the, the uh, bonds that, the kind of interactions that link the proteins in the virion can come apart readily. And they come apart again based on signals received in the host cell, which we'll see next time. All right, so that's the structure, how the structure is made and how it then can come apart to deliver the genome. So we're going to talk about the general ways that virions are put together. But before we do, just to make sure um, we're on the same page, a little bit of uh, perspective on the sizes again. In the first lecture, we talked about sizes involved in virus particles. Um, and remember, uh, we talk about nanometers quite often. An alpha helix of a protein is typically about a nanometer in diameter. Uh, DNA is two nanometers. And here is a poliovirus virion, 30 nanometers in diameter compared to a ribosome, which is about 20. So polio is a small virion. Remember, the biggest ones we know of are 750 nanometers. So you can see uh, not much bigger, really, 10 times bigger than uh, or so than the diameter of a, of a DNA strand. Uh, the first reconstitution of a virus particle from its components was done with tobacco mosaic virus. A lot of firsts carried out. Remember, this is the first virus to be discovered. And what was done by these investigators in 1955 uh, was they purified the nucleic acid, which is RNA for this virus. They purified the coat protein. So this virion, which is shown here, remember, it's a single rod-shaped virion. It's made up of a single coat protein repeated many times. And all those coat proteins engage in very similar interactions. So they mix the RNA and the coat protein, and they spontaneously assemble to form the virion. And they, in fact, showed that that virus assembled from the components was infectious. So this was really the beginning of our, of our understanding of virus structure, that the components self-assemble. You can take them apart, and you can put them back together again without any major changes. And this also, besides being the first virus discovered, the first one to be crystallized, as we'll see in a moment, and the first time that RNA was shown to be genetic material. 